They say that change is the only constant in life. In this season of Swim Upstream, we're breaking down specific instances of change in software organizations when both technical and human aspects were involved. Jenna Quindica is an experienced software engineer and has led a number of teams throughout her career and worked at companies both big and small. Jenna recently joined Square as their staff software engineer. All right, let's dive in. Let's kick things off with some warm-up questions. So what have you been listening to on Spotify? I'm laughing because the song that, I'm list- that I've been listening to on repeat, it's not safe for work. But the reason that I've been listening to it is because I've been following the journey of this song being created on TikTok. The song is called Light Switch. And the whole premise of the song is that it's centered around this, um, this accent beat which is actually the recording of a light switch being flicked. So the song is called Light Switch, and it's created with a literal, I watched this on TikTok, guy holds a microphone up to a light switch, flicks it on, and then mixes it into this song. And um, the beauty of this song is that it loops infinitely, so you can't tell when the song starts and ends if you have it on repeat. So it's the perfect song to just have going in the background. I'm going to look for that. And also, I'm interested why it's not work safe. Uh, so I'll, I'll check that out later on. Um, <laughs> OK. Tell us like where you are right now. Uh, where are we catching you in terms of your career at the moment? You know, it's really funny. The timing of you reaching out to me, I had I just started at, at Block, formerly known as Square. Um, and I also just got my first staff software engineering position, which is a role that I've been wanting desperately for the last two years. I um, I had been working in organizations that didn't have a staff, staff position because we were so small. And I was writing my own promo packets, like collecting these experiences that I've been having at these smaller companies that would never give me a promotion into this role. And I was just spending those last two years working towards it. And um, I was really happy in my last role, like really actually very happy. I loved the team I was on. I thought that we were doing some really incredible things. Um, But then this square opportunity came knocking. And then also they decided to give me the staff position, which I never thought they would. Um, I thought I was interviewing for like a senior software engineering position. But so anyway, you caught me at this like incredible time. I feel very validated in my career. (laughs) Correct me if I'm wrong. Would you say that on top of, you know, just being a very significant engineer on the team, you're also expected to raise the level of engineering and software uh, development in your team? Is that what it means to be a software engineer, uh, a staff software engineer? I think the big difference between senior software engineer and staff software engineer at Square, and by the way, I don't speak for Square. (laughs) Um, I'm not speaking on this podcast as a representative of Square. But my understanding is that the difference between senior and staff is that staff has effectiveness cross-functionally, whereas a senior software engineer would be expected to be effective cross-team. So in my last role, when I was one of six engineers, a big portion of my role was uh, getting down in the weeds directly with our customer stakeholders. And the profile of our customer stakeholders ranged from IT to HR to communications, uh, internal comms, um, all the way up to senior leadership. And so I was getting down in the weeds working with all of these different kinds of profiles. And I think that's the exact experience that got me this staff software engineering role that real experience of talking with people who do nothing like what you do and being effective at it and driving, driving outcomes. Mentorship is a huge part of being a senior engineer is being, and also being a staff software engineer. I'm lucky in that I had manager experience in my last two roles, not significant manager experience, but enough to, enough to know how hard it is. And I think you really can't get to this level if you don't have a good enough understanding to teach others how to do it. Like, yes, you have to get there yourself, but you're not gonna be consistent with your efficacy until you're able to teach others how to also be effective. And that was the big thing for me is being consistent. 
in this season of, of the podcast were, were we want to be obsessed with change and how that happens with the well, you know what challenges you need to 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 face to to make it happen and it sounds like there are two i'm connecting this with change what you just described it, it sounds like there are two things here that are, are very much connected one rarely you can do significant change without being able to work it systematically and be able to communicate with different stakeholders in the organization that you are in right so having that skill set and having that system understanding is crucial a lot of times. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is mentorship. I just think it's like, it's, it's one of the best ways to change, to, to bring change into the world, because usually you spend like really, it, it might be a few minutes, but those few minutes can sometimes affect someone significantly. And that change goes on and you don't hit, even have to make any effort because that person, is going on with that thing that you taught them, right? So what a great way to make change, right? It's really interesting that you're calling that out um, because it reminds me that you don't really know when someone is listening and when it will catalyze change in a good or negative direction. And it's actually a great segue into a story I wanted to share today because I wasn't explicitly trying to make organizational level change. I think what happened here, so just to sum up, is I felt pretty stubborn about this idea that I had in this direction. And I pretty much dug my heels in and made a bunch of compromises until it happened. <laughs> That's how I would sum up this story. So here's, here's what happened. I was employee number two at a startup I had just moved to the San Francisco Bay Area for this startup. I think I was 21 years old, employee number two. Um, and every other coworker of mine had been a long tenured Google software engineer. So I joined because I wanted, I was so excited about the opportunity to work with these experienced people. To be honest, I don't know why they hired me because it kind of makes no sense when you like look back and like, oh, you were 21 and you were employee number two, like what? And I had been there about maybe about nine months and we were trying to find, we had realized that our first product that we had launched did not make product market fit. So our mission as a company was to uh, pay attention to these long running forums on the internet, be bulletins and forum forums that I guess now in 2022 might have been running for the last 30 years. So our, our idea was to pay attention to these forums, ingest their data, inspect it, analyze it, apply some machine learning, and try and surface or try and retrain our models regarding ranking content. We believed that because this content had been running on the internet for decades, decades longer than Twitter, you know, Facebook, we believed that the data on these forums had more expertise than anywhere else on the internet. Mm, okay. Um, community sourced information that had been curated over the last several decades. Um, and, so our and, first and like product, the, the most experienced people in the world at the time were writing stuff about things that they were very experienced about, right? Right. These were Google engineers who had worked on search. Mm -hmm. They noticed that Google wasn't really spending time looking at these vBulletin and Zen 4 PHP forums. At the time we were talking, uh, oh my gosh, and at the time, you know, we were experiencing this Donald Trump election. And so Ground truth data was extremely important to us um, as a company. And I think just even in our, in our social circles, it was really important to us. So we built the search product. Um, we would ingest all the data on these PHP forms. So we had to write PHP to do this. Um, and we had built the search engine and people liked it, but it wasn't hitting product market fit. And so if we were gonna survive as a startup, you know, as a company, we needed to do something different and it was always the idea that we would take this search data. Basically, once we have the data, then we can do interesting things to that data to transfer learn, to rank content, to curate content. So we were trying to figure out what would be our next product that would allow us to quickly iterate and test our machine learning models while still delivering value to the world. 
Um, because, you know, we could have taken that data and then disappeared for 10 years and potentially done something cool. But you can't do that in a startup. You've got to deliver some kind of value to your customers and continue to get revenue. Okay, so this is about summertime. And we were we were working out of our investor's office in Redwood City. There were, I think there were six of us at this time. Two people were remote. Okay, yeah, so four or five people in the office. And we would just work. And then eventually someone would say something. And then we'd all just, our, our whole workday would be derailed. And we'd be like sucked into the big conversations in the middle of this giant open space that we shared with our investors. And eventually, I don't know if I said it first or someone else, but we started talking about what if we just sent people an email, an email of the 10 top ranked or curated content that was created in the last week. And then we analyzed their open and click through rates. Um, and then we use that data and fed it back into our machine learning model and then magically we have some kind of train model. So you, you'd um, be pushing instead of just pulling uh, stuff, right? So Exactly. Okay. So we spent probably two weeks throwing out all these kinds of ideas because a lot of the team wanted to build an app. They wanted to build a social media app where you had infinite scroll and you could like things and share things. And, you know, we, we wanted to build that. I think every I think every was pretty clear everyone wanted to build that. But... We didn't have our Series A yet. We were still running off our seed round. And that seed round, I think, had been, we had we were going up on the two-year mark of that seed round. We were really running out of money. And we just didn't have the revenue to keep going if we didn't raise another round. And so time was of the essence. And we we were getting desperate. And so we spent about two weeks talking about this over and over and over. And I'm like, look, why don't we just make an email? Like, a marketing email. And when you really think about it, these PHP forums, they weren't sending email. If you wanted to access content on these PHP forums, you had to remember the domain. You had to navigate to it. You had to remember to navigate to it. There were no hooks. There were no ways to pull you back in. And, and that's how you access that content. And so to me, I love email. I love that I can curate it. I can unsubscribe. I can I can mark that stuff as spam. Like I love email. You have so much control over the content that arrives in your inbox. And so I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. We could do this. This, you know, this could be a great experiment. Um, it's really quick. Sending emails so easy. Like, what do you mean it's gonna be hard? Like it's email. And kind of like what I was saying earlier, the thing that sticks with me to this day, it's been, I don't know, five, five years or whatever, it's however long it's been, six years. And the thing that really sticks to me about this story, and the reason I keep talking about this story is my CTO said in one of these big brainstorming sessions that he never wanted to work on email. He thought email was the worst. He would never dedicate his life to email. It's not something he wants to spend his time on. He would quit if we worked on email. And he said all these things and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is our CTO. If, I, if, we, he, if he doesn't agree, what are we gonna do? And I genuinely did not see another option. And eventually I said, okay, okay, we're, we're not going to do this forever. We're just going to, it's just an experiment. You know, we just want to like get some data. We want to test our ideas. And this is just an experiment. It's just a test. We can craft this test to be time bound. So it doesn't have to. We don't have to dedicate a ton of engineering resources to it. It's not something that's going to live forever. We can write some Python scripts to send these emails. We we could take CSV dumps of the database and just run the command on our computers. Like this is not this does not have to be a productionized system. You know, we might just throw everything away in ten weeks. Like it's let's just find out if it works as a test. You're taking this this huge frog, right? That the CTO would not swallow ever, and you were making it into this small pill, right? It might have been obvious to someone like in his position that that's what you were doing, and you, he would need to swallow the frog at the end, right? If that worked yeah. out. So how did that work? I raised my hand and I, and I said, I'm going to do all the manual work that I have to do to make this happen, and we're going to start okay. sending emails next. I promised we would send emails by the next week and we would pick one forum and we would pick, 
I think we picked like uh, users that had been active in the last 30 days. And I, I said, we're just going to do it and we're going to get results. And that's what we, that's what we want. The method doesn't matter here. I, I'm sorry to just to stop you here again. So we took the frog, put it, made it into a pill. But the second thing here that made it work was that you said, I'm going to do this. It's on me. Right. And it's, I'm, I'm assuming it, it would have been harder to say, don't do it when you're saying I, I, I'm taking this on myself. Right. So why worry about it? Is that true? I think so. I mean, let's be clear about what I was volunteering to do. I was volunteering to go into a production database, take some CSV dumps of emails, PII, stuff that you should really never do. Um, and then I was creating a Python script that would, you know, query for the content we were going to send into the, send, put into the email and then call an API to then pair the emails with the content together. <laughs> and the thing that makes me upset to this day is we wanted those emails to be personalized. It was so important to us that each of those emails said, hi, first name in the email. I don't know if it was in the first rev or the second or the third, but Throwing in the fact that it had to be personalized was like the hardest part about this whole manual process. Would have been way easier if we just copied and pasted the content into MailChimp and just sent one email, the same email to everybody. Anyway, yes, I signed myself up for 12 to 16 hour work days for an entire summer. And so when I said, you know, maybe a month before we realized these issues, that email would be easy, I was wrong. We spent the 10 weeks running the experiment. Our emails were wildly successful. We were beating industry standard click-through rates by, I think, 50%. It was just really incredible how, how well these emails worked. We ended up signing an incredible deal with a huge uh, aggregator of forum communities. So this company that had acquired a number of communities wanted to roll out our search engine, and they also wanted to use our newsletter product. So I think, you know, we raised our series A on this email product, which no one ever believed we would. And, you know, I left the company maybe about a year after we raised our series A. And I do, I do miss it, but I, I don't regret it because it was the right thing for me. But, um, you know, it's really funny. You reached out to me maybe like a month or six weeks after this company that I'm talking about got acquired because of this email product. <laughs> What's missing for me is the process of swallowing that frog. I mean, I would assume, and tell me if that's right, that you tried something and you saw enough good results at first to justify keeping in this direction. Is that true? <sighs> Yes, if I recall correctly, we were we were onboarding. We had we had forums lining up to, to to be a part of our newsletter experiment, and we had to like gate the experiment because we couldn't take on more forums. And so I think we started off with five or six, and I think we eventually rolled out to twelve within the first couple months. And I think just that excitement that we generated with these customers was enough to decide, oh okay, wait, if we want to double the size of this experiment, now we're going to have to invest in productionizing this system. I think, honestly, it, it worked so well in that we did one thing. We got some good feedback. We did, we did more of it. We got more good feedback. And eventually you, we created this wonderful like feedback loop where the more we did, the better outcomes we, we, we experienced. And so that made it easy for everyone on the team to see that this was a worthwhile use of our time. And I think if we hadn't crafted this experiment in a week by week thing where we were getting results after the first week, after the second week, I don't think it would have gotten this far. And so today, even now at Square, when I'm seeing these projects run multiple months, it's really important for us as engineers to figure out how we can validate our ideas as soon as we can, because the worst thing you can do is spend five years on an email product and not see your company get acquired. <laughs> so basically, it's, it's not only that you're making sure you're not going in the right direction, 
It's also that if you know that this, that there are steps in the process and that you can exit at each one of those, mm -hmm. it's easier to make the decision to go for something risky, right? Because you're not risking the next two years. You're only risking the next few weeks, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would, couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> I wish we could continue this. Um, that's that's really all the time that we have to, for today. And, and Jenna, thank you so much for coming on and telling us our, your story. And I, I'm sure it's going to be an inspiration to, to people that want to make change in tough situations. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That's all the time we have for today. To read episode transcripts, Check out our past season, suggest an episode, or join our growing community of developers, head to swim.io. That's swim with two m's.io.